Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to uh, talk about um, this uh, subject, uh, multi messenger astronomy. I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me to come here to talk, to talk about this from an uh, astronomer's point of view. Okay, so uh, this is me. Yeah. So in the past Decades, several decades. Actually, astronomers were talking about uh, multi-wavelength astronomy. That is, uh, observations not only in optical but also in radio, in X-ray, in gamma rays. Yeah, but uh, of course, we know multi-wavelength observations is very important for our understanding of uh, astronomical systems. But uh, in many theories, actually, we also see there are uh, predict predictions for other. Uh, signals and also in nature there are also other messengers which can carry information yeah, to tell us what's going on there in different uh, astronomical systems so now more and more people are getting more and more excited with this kind of development because that really has come true the multi messenger astronomy so by multi-messenger, then we mean besides photons, then we can also measure gravitational waves and also neutrinos from some systems. And that helps a lot, that helps a lot to understand the nature of the systems. And in a broader sense, uh, by multi-messenger, actually, we also want to discuss cosmic rays. But cosmic rays is more difficult to, uh, to uh, trace back for their origin because cosmic rays are charged particles and in the universe they are magnetic fields so when you detect cosmic rays you cannot simply trace back to find their origin okay but they do carry also important information so just like uh, this picture here I, I just uh, took from physics today for example there's a source and we observe that source, uh, photons, X-ray, or gamma rays with a satellite, a space telescope. And neutrinos come from a source also and hit Antarctica. And we also detect that neutrino. And cosmic rays, if cosmic, ray, cosmic rays come from also that source, they will go uh, along a wavy uh, path. And then somewhere on the Earth, we may detect them. For photons and neutrinos from the direction, it's easier to identify the source. But for cosmic rays, then it's not. It's not. But, but still, if we have good understanding of the astronomic system that we are talking about, then we have more confident on interpreting the possibility that they produce those high energy cosmic rays that we see. So in general or altogether, the observed spectrum, cosmic ray spectrum, should be consistent uh, with our theoretical un understanding of the origins. I mean, statistically, the overall uh, spectrum should be consistent and the flux and so on. Okay? So cosmic rays will be used in a more indirect way. All right. So, this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I will, at first, briefly review so far the only three, the only three real multi-messenger started event. Uh, one is ice cube uh, 17 This is a neutrino event. And a very famous one, this uh, gravitational wave event, uh, GW 17087, which is also the GRB uh, 170878. Okay, this is the second event, and the third event is Supernova 1987A. Okay, I will briefly review this and then talk about some potential sources and also facilities and also some activities in Taiwan. So this is our line of my talk. All right. So for this ice cube event, this is ice cube. I won't go into details. Uh, basically, this is Antarctica, and then uh, in the huge, thick ice shelf, 
uh, in Antarctica, there are more than 5,000 optical detectors buried, buried underneath the surface. Okay. Anyway, if there's a neutrino, this is uh, Antarctica, so if there's a neutrino coming from outer space and hit the ice shift, produce, for example, muon, then the muon travels in the, in the ice, can produce some chunk of light, and these detectors can detect that chunk of light. Okay, so that one can infer that there's a neutrino, blah, blah, blah. And ice cube actually started working, I think more than 10 years ago, and they did detect neutrinos time varying flux of neutrinos. But it was always difficult to really pin down the direction. But finally, finally there was a high energy neutrino which make the direction determination easier. This neutrino is uh, about 300 TeV, 300 TeV. And this event happened in 2017, September 22nd. So there's a high energy muon. Actually, this is produced by a neutrino, and then all these detectors somehow get the signal from from this uh, from this chunk of light. And because it was possible to determine the direction to a very good extent, so one actually identified this event with an astronomical source, which is a blazer. The blazer called TXS 0506 plus 056. Okay, it is a flaring gamma ray blazer. So this is the story. Uh, the ice cube direction, the ice cube location of the event is this gray gray circle here at 50% uh, confidence level, and this is 90% confidence level, and the green one, the green one, is the location. Is the location determined by magic, which is a TeV facility. They measure TeV photons, photon TeV facilities, and the location is like this. Okay, this is a zoom in part like this, and also Fermi. Fermi is a GeV, uh, more than GeV uh, facility. So the Fermi. The location of this blazer is here, this uh, blue one, light blue one. And this source is a radio source. It's called TXS, that's a Texas survey or some radio, radio sources. So it was known, this, this, this source was known a long time ago. So it's a radio source, it's a blazer, so the location is here. Therefore, by this kind of uh, location coincidence, one was very happy to say, oh, we finally detect one neutrino, high energy neutrino, from a blazer, from a blazer. More than this, actually more than this. In fact, this blazer was flaring in that, during that period, during that period. So if you take a look at this uh, figure, Say, this is time, this is time, and the neutrino event happens at this epoch. And these are TV photon facilities, TV, TV photon facilities. So, at the beginning, this also was observed from time to time by some facilities. So for TV photons, nothing really interesting here, but then after this event, all these facilities actually paid attention to this direction to this blazer and and find that it was indeed flaring. The T V flux actually increases, increases. Here there are some upper limit here. So the increase of T V photon actually comes later, somewhat later. But then if we check G V G V observations, G V from Fermi and also from Agile, then we see that this blazer at the beginning is kind of this flux level and then goes up already, goes up. So in a flaring state and at some epoch, one neutrino was detected. Okay, and we also have X-ray, X-ray flux. So it's also flaring 
and this is um, power index of that X-ray, and optical. Now, a lot of optical observations and also indicate some brightening, brightening level. I mean, the optical facet also increases in this epoch. And also radio observations also indi indicates some brightening also in radio waves. So because of the direction coincidence and also the activities, the photon activities. So this kind of identification was considered quite firm. Okay. So this is uh, the first neutron event from the blazer. And for this kind of observation, usually we need a lot of uh, facilities, different facilities all around the world. So very often you will see, I mean in the future, very often you will see a figure like this. This is not from Michael, this is not from Michael, this is Ice Cube, okay? So uh, there are different facilities and some uh, satellite uh, doing this kind of observation together, okay? Uh, I should not go into details. So anyway, <laughs> this is the spectrum of that blazer. Some great, 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 uh, great buffs is the um, spectrum for this blazer in so-called quiescent state. And then in the flaring state, flaring state, you see some colorful, colorful, colorful ones. Okay, so this laser is in a different state. So maybe that's why it produces more neutrinos, more energy neutrinos, so that we have better chance to, to detect that event. So the lesson from this event is that okay, this is a laser. So this is strong supporting evidence to say that in a laser jet. In the blazer's jet, particles are accelerated. Okay, so therefore, high energy neutrinos are produced. So this is uh, strong evidence to support also not only the acceleration particle acceleration mechanism happening in an AGN jet, but also the origin for some cosmic rays. Okay, we have some cos cosmic rays from supernova remnant shock uh, from the acceleration from the shock. And this is also a very important source for cosmic rays. So that is the lesson we learned from this event. And then, second rotational event. Uh, up to now, there are 11 events detected by LIGO and Virgo. Uh, for those black hole mergers, we don't have any electromagnetic counterparts. That is also expected, not surprising. But there is one, there is one, uh, which uh, coincides with uh, short GRB. And that one was interpreted as neutron star merger, and so we have a lot of, a lot of uh, electromagnetic observations. This is the event that I want to talk about, but I believe many of you know this event quite well, so maybe I will go faster. Uh, this is gravitational uh, signature, and it happens some at some epoch, and then after 1.7 seconds, 1.7 seconds, this is uh, gamma ray detection. Gamma ray detection. This is uh, from integral, and this is from Fermi. So after 1.7 seconds, and then not only the coincidence in time, but also in space. Location, so uh, well, from gravitational wave, the location determination is, is poorer than uh, photons, of course. But anyway, uh, using Fermi and some other satellite, then one can pin down the location to a smaller area, and then later with optical observation, for example, this one, one can see this point here, this is uh, after the gravitational event, 10.9 uh, hours, one see something here. And then, 20 days, it disappears. This is a galaxy, and something happened here. But not only this, if you go to the paper here, you will see this is really multi-messenger observation. At the beginning, this is gravitational wave, we, we saw it, and gamma rays, and gamma rays. By the way, this is time, this is time, and different scale here. Linear scale in seconds, log scale in days. 
we have gamma rays, and then X-ray observations actually did not see anything until until this time. And this is roughly more than 10 days. And this is Chandra observation, and you see there's a point here. Okay. And for UV and optical, it was detected only at this time. Not, not this time, only this time. So you see, there are a lot of facilities taking a picture of this one, and there's a point here, there's a point here. Yeah, there's a point here. And for this Tekka Ken, these two pictures are from Tekka Ken. So you see again, this point, and disappeared, because it's after 14 days, and this is about one day, one day after the gravitational event. Yeah, so you see this transient, and it disappears. Okay. Yep. And then, also, we have radio observations, and it comes even after. So radio observations, there's some sources here detected at radio uh, wavelengths. Yep. So all of these actually were accomplished again by a lot of uh, astronomers, yeah, a lot of facilities. So again, you see this kind of picture. Yeah. All right. And for this event, in fact, this GRB is a quite special one. It's a short one. This figure you see, these are our GRBs. This is redshift of the GRB, if we can determine that. And this is uh, the energy output, assuming isotropic output. And blue ones are long GRB. These uh, yellow ones are short GRB. And this particular short GRB is actually here. So it's a very low luminosity and very nearby one. So very, very special one. But anyway, from all the observation of after growth, then one actually can uh, be happy to say it supports the, the uh, common wisdom. I mean, it has been a long time that people suspect short B are coming from neutron star merger. Okay, the theory was there long, for a long time. And now, this observation, together with gravitational observation, gravitational wave observation. So, the evidence now is getting very strong, very strong to support this idea. So, it's a neutron star merger, short GRB, so-called Kirinova. Okay. And we have some people here working on Kirinova, I believe, uh, Hang and then blah, blah, blah. All right. But then, what? remains actually it's not clear. After this merger, it's not yet clear. It's not yet clear. Okay, let's move up. Let's move up. I, mm, time is really short. Okay, the third event is a very old event. This is a supernova eight, uh, 1987 age. Um, so this is LMC, large Magellanic cloud in the southern sky. We probably don't quite have this uh, chance to see it. Well, some of you do. Anyway, on this date, on this date, uh, some point, some something happened here. It's, it's about here. Okay, there's a new star. So it's a new star was discovered, and then uh, gradually the system actually comes like this, like this. Very strange, very strange one. Yeah. And um, this field of view here is 30 arc second, and this is 40 arc minute. So this is a zoom in view of this one. Okay. Anyway, I'm not talking. I'm not going to talk about uh, supernova remnant evolution. My point is that for this event, this is only photons, electromagnetic waves, right? But as many of you actually also know, there were neutrinos detected at the same time. At the same time, I mean, about three hours before, before the optical brightening, some neutrinos were detected. And here, this is time, and this is the neutrino energy. There were about 20 also neutrinos detected, three hours before the optical brightening. And the neutrinos uh, have different energies. These are low energy neutrinos, MeV, several MeV. And I took this figure from this reference because they are talking about some model for different uh, 
reports call speed. Yeah. They, they have their model with different speed. They predict neutrinos should go like this energy, this energy, this energy, and so on. So that means the measurement of these neutrinos along with their energy evolution actually gives very strong constraint on the supernova explosion models. Okay. Yeah, so this is very good events, and uh, unfortunately, the uncertainty here actually is large. So we should expect, we should wait for the next one, for the next one. All right, so that was three events, and I have only 12 minutes left, probably. Okay, anyway, so I will briefly talk about uh, potential sources. So from those three events, actually, we learned something. And from many other theoretical works, we also learn other things. For example, uh, AGN. AGN is an emo important source, like uh, like the ice cube event is from an AGN, a blazer, a certain type of AGN from the jet. And also, supermassive black hole merger in AGN is very likely, very likely there can be there can be uh, two cores. Not all agents, but very often. For example, here I show you a picture of Cygnus A. This is a radio image of Cygnus A, which is an, a radio galaxy, an AGN. And if you zoom in to the core here, actually you see two cores. And this one, this one is believed to be another satellite actually merging with the larger one. And Along with this merger, there can be two supermassive black hole merges sometime in the future. Yeah. Okay. And for agents, there are different types. Okay, we are not in astronomy all that, so forget about this. Anyway, so these are quite promising sources to see neutrinos, to see gravitational waves, and together with photons. And also GRBs, again GRBs. GRBs, we have long GRB, we have short GRB. And for long GRB, it's a supermassive star collapse. This is now the major, major opinion, major opinion. And for short, short GRB, it's neutron star or uh, neutron star merger or neutron star black hole merger. So for these systems, we expect to see uh, gravitational waves as we have already the LIGO event. And also, one can also expect to see possibly some neutrinos. Okay, that's also possible. And another very really important source is uh, supernova itself. Core collapse supernova. Uh, pro pro uh, progenitor, maybe a super red uh, supergiant or blue supergiant, then we can see it in electromagnetic waves. And then when the core actually bounced, we have uh, neutrinos. Yeah, when the core, can, yeah, when the star is up to the final stage, we have neutrinos, a lot of neutrinos produced, and then we have gravitational wave. And for all these things, so far we don't have detection of gravitational waves from a core collapse supernova. It depends on the sensitivity and so on. But uh, theoretically, we expect that uh, gravitational waves should be produced. Okay, so the problem is uh, more quantitative estimate what kind of uh, facility can detect how far away supernova okay yep all right so this is a brief summary for the potential sources and there are actually others there are actually others like uh, black hole binary supermassive black hole binary before before way before they, they merged there can be some signature of gravitational waves, okay? And there are some others. Uh, because they are in different frequency range, okay? Yep. So, now comes facilities. Uh, as you can see, actually we rely on a lot of electromagnetic wave observations. And so, uh, they are mostly transient events. So now, in astronomy, there are different projects. These are for some uh, major ones or, or often seen, often heard ones. Okay, and uh, well, this is uh, 
already a long time a collaboration with several smaller telescopes all around the world. And this is from uh, Caltech, and this is in Hawaii. Taiwan is also involved in this PenStar project. And LST will come online in a few years. This will be a huge one, eight meter telescope in uh, Chile. And all of this, they watch the sky all the time, all the time. They do survey, and so they can see, catch some transients. All right, I will probably skip rotational wave facilities because I believe um, you have heard uh, uh, enough. So I will skip this part. And then for neutrinos, beside Ice Cube, there's another project called uh, Antares. This is uh, in the uh, Mediterranean Sea near southern France. It's similar to Ice Cube, but in an ocean, in an ocean. Okay, and uh, the size is going, is going to be similar to uh, ice cube. So this one will be also useful. And there are others for low energy neutrinos, like uh, Super K. If you do a um, particle physics experiment, then you know a lot of, uh, about Super K and some other facilities. For photon detections, for TV, right now we have has Magic, Veritas, Hawk. These are all TV facilities. And CDA, Cherenkov Telescope Array, uh, will come in a few years. I, I, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, this is will uh, be a very large facility. And in the GV range, now we have Fermi and Ajire. Uh, so far, I don't have any idea about the next project uh, at this energy range. And for MEV, right now we have integral, basically only integral. And uh, there are some proposals like uh, E-Astro Game in Europe, but uh, which uh, is still waiting for funding. Well, it's they're trying to get funding. Uh -huh. And also COSI, this is what I am working on. <laughs> okay. And there's another a project also in the U.S. Cosi is also in the U.S. Uh, this is uh, led by UC Berkeley, and this is um, led by uh, New Hampshire University, maybe. Yep. And in hard X-rays, right now we have these facilities, and then very soon there is another new one called Swarm, which is particularly uh, for GRB monitoring. That is a Chinese-French uh, collaboration, and there are many other facilities. Okay, so it's very uh, active. I mean, in uh, electromagnetic observation, very, very active. But for this kind of multi-messenger observation, actually a large-scale coordination is important. And astronomers on Earth actually have been doing that for a long time, actually, already. And two examples are, if you are interested, you can go to check these two, these two sites for GCN and ATL. And uh, also the LIGO, LIGO event, I think, will be broadcasted through GCN channel. Almost in real time, almost in real time. Okay, yep. And then, so, some activities in Taiwan. Uh, besides this theory meeting, yeah. And also besides, uh, some people actually working on uh, transit event observation already for a long time. Yeah. As a strongest job. Okay. I will mention three things. One is neutrino and gravitational wave from core collapse supernovae and kiranova and uh Pai Chen and Monglu. Monglu Monglu is sitting somewhere somewhere there. Yeah. They recently got support from NCTS yeah, to move forward for this kind of study to gather more people. And they I think they, they should give a talk about details. Okay. <laughs> they have some computations, those are gravitational wave um, uh, patterns, okay, there's waveforms, okay. So, yep, anyway. And then I also know there's another group of people in Taipei, uh, Lin Fong Li in National Taiwan Normal University, and also Hai No, in Academic Institute of Physics, and some others. They also form a group uh, working on these kind of things. They, of course, they also join Kagra and also they are responsible for calibration source for Kagra. That is quite important. And 
There's another thing is MEV gamma ray instrumentation. As you can see, GRP is a very important thing in this uh, multi messenger astronomy. So GRP, so MEV is the energy to uh, monitor GRP. So there's another thing called uh, COSI team. One minute left, good, thank you. So uh, this is what actually I'm working on. And this is instrumentation work. So since I don't have, I don't quite have time, I will show you very quickly. This is the collaboration. Uh, UC Berkeley Road Coordination Lab and Tsinghua and NCU and Agnes Nika and also NDL and also a group from France. Uh, from France. And we are making a detector use a high purity germanium to detect MEV photons. That's the idea. And currently we are still in the fright stage to demonstrate to demonstrate uh, the performance of these instruments. And uh, in 2016, we had a balloon flight from New Zealand and uh, gone around the Earth and landed in Peru. And during that flight, actually, we detected one GRP. This is all sky, all sky. And with roughly 10 second data, this is all sky map within that 10 seconds. And that is a very bright GRP. And use that data, actually, we uh, determine, we try to figure out the polarization of the MEV from the GRB, and we did not have detection, but we have uh, upper limit to the polarization degree, which is about uh, 47 or 46 percent, set an upper limit to that source. Okay, and in that right, we also detect other things like the grab by the galactic, galactic center. This is 511 kV map, this one, and we have also detected Centaurus A, which is an AGN, and Cygnus S1, which is a black hole binary. Okay, and we are working on that, and uh, we are also discussing uh, some possible space missions. So, finally, that's the story I want to talk about. Thank you very much. So in one of your plot, you, uh, in one of your slides, you show a plot saying that the supernova neutrino energy would depend on the, some particular velocity. Could you say once again that point, which velocity is that? That is the that is the velocity of the rebound material. So the ejecta. Yes, the very innermost ejecta. And uh, oh, sorry wrong direction. And I think for details, maybe you can check that uh, reference here, reference here. And that is indeed the velocity of the, yeah, ejecta, but very innermost ejecta. The cut, right, right, right after the cut, yeah. Uh, in the ice cube event, because you said it's coming from a blazer and the light cycle, the blazer can't have a light cycle, right? And would, would that be, we will see another such high energy neutron event regularly? Yes, I would expect so. I would expect so, because they are flaring blazers all the time. Yes. Yeah, I would expect so. So the problem then is the uh, neutrino flux, whether it's uh, large enough for us to de detect. Yeah. And of course, not only one neutrino was produced, right? Not only one. Yeah. What's so, that? Yeah. Uh, what's that? Uh, the photon can we can measure the polarization? Yes. Okay. Yes, but not in GV. For blazars, usually it's uh, optical in optical observation. The blazar was uh, defined from optical observation. The optical light is strongly polarized. Oh, okay. Yeah, strongly polarized. Yeah, I, I, I expect yeah. when they have a neutrino, they also have electron. The electron can undergo that canton scattering yes. and the photon will be polarized. Yes. Yes. That's good. <laughs> yes. Uh, any question? Oh. Uh, could you comment on the theory standing, for example, for ice cube event? Do people have a kind of theory can consistently explain all the events from different uh, observations? I cannot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I cannot. I will chat later. Yeah. So even though among 
in Messenger, we don't have any improvement on modeling the AGA. Oh, the yes, I believe so. I believe, I believe they are. Originally, they are already uh, models for this kind of jet and extraction and emission in the, in the jet, but some some shot, some shot in, inside the jet, yeah. And I believe with new with new input, neutrino measurement, I believe so, but I'm not in that business. So, but I believe so. With that new input, certainly there should be some improvements. Yeah. So next time we should invite another one to come here. <laughs> okay. Sorry. We have to stop here. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor. Yeah. Thank you.